it's, uh, it's needs to be done and it's just done by the hospitalists. This year's theme is Jim Stanzik.
The first one we're going to sing is Puinia Wisła Puinia. The Wisła River flows through the middle of Poland, and so therefore it's a very special river to everyone in Poland. It goes from the mountains to, through Krakow, through Warsaw, all the way to Gdańsk and to the Baltic Sea. So uh, I just came back from a trip to Poland and they had such a heat wave in the middle of the country that the Wisła River was so shallow that you could walk across it, wade across it, almost knee high, and usually it's like 16 feet deep. So that was very interesting. All right, are you ready? I'll give a little introduction first.
University of Nebraska Omaha. I got my undergrad degree at UNL, but I study creative nonfiction. Um, so one of the things I'm going to do today is read an essay that I wrote about one of my trips to Poland. But first, I'll tell you a little bit about how I ended up going there. Um, I've been there four times now. And one of the first things I always get asked is, are you Polish? And no, I'm not. Um, my family is predominantly German, but my church does a mission trip with a church in Poland, in Jabornik. And the first time I heard about it, I thought, well, I'd never thought about going to Poland before, but it sounded really interesting. It's an ESL camp. We teach English to kids that range in age from 8 to 14. And there's usually about 60 kids at the camp, and they stay there with us, which is pretty unique. There's other camps in the area that are similar, but they actually stay overnight with us, which is pretty rare. Uh, the church there has a small hostel, and there's a kitchen there and everything. So we, they stay there. We eat together every meal. <laughs> and the, I was drawn by the fact that it was language and sports, because it was advertised as an ESL sports camp. And that's two things that I really like. And so I went, um, not really knowing anything about Poland or the Polish people, but I fell in love with the country, with the people, with the, the food, <laughs> the language, everything. And so I keep going back year after year. And so this is an essay I wrote about the second time I was there. And it's, it's titled 11,520. And I use a series of numbers and then tell you what the number is important for. All right, so 60. There are 60 steps from my room at camp to my classroom in the attic. One step for each student in the camp. On the last day of class, I went up those steps at least a dozen times. That's 720 steps without counting the trips down the stairs or all the trips I made just to the second floor. 60 steps to drop off my camera and water bottle. 60 steps down again. 60 steps to come back up with a towel for our feet washing activity. And down. 60 more to bring up the bucket of water. And another trip to get the lesson plans I forgot in my room. And another to get a spoon for food day. There was a trip for taking the food up to the classroom. One to get paper towels. Then later trips to put away sports equipment. After two weeks of hiking every morning, my calves quaked with every step. It was my second year at Yvornik English Camp and my second year with a class in the attic. Each trip up the stairs was as exhausting as the first time I entered the room, gasping from the altitude. The same classroom, the same class level, new students and a new co-teacher. 5,064 miles. That's how far Yvornik, a small mountain town in southwest Poland, is from my home in Nebraska. The first time I came here to teach English at the camp in 2012, I was nervous. It was my first time teaching anything. I wasn't supposed to teach that year, but Piotr, the camp boss, wanted to add one more class. Suddenly, with just one day to prepare, I became a co-teacher with another American, Vicky. I thought my second trip in 2013 would be easier. This time I would have lesson plans in advance, no more writing them at 10 or 11 o'clock the night before. Katie, my co-teacher, and I met for lunch about a month before departure to make plans. We soon learned it was impossible to write them until we knew our class and knew their skill level. We had a few games in mind, such as Simon says for when we talk about body parts, but otherwise, we had to wait. Once again, I found myself trudging up the stairs to the attic each night, or occasionally the morning of, to write lessons. 24. It takes approximately 24 hours to travel from my home in Nebraska to the camp in Yavornik, Poland. It takes, one and a half hour, it takes a one and a half hour flight from either Lincoln or Omaha to Chicago. From there, an eight hour flight to Frankfurt, Germany, then another one and a half hour flight to Krakow, Poland, and finally a two hour bus ride to Yavornik to get us to our destination. I'm five feet nine inches tall, 
and I have no torso to speak of. The bottom of my bust to my natural waist is only about four or five inches. Flying is a special kind of hell for me. My knees touch the back of the seat in front of me from the moment I sit down. I hate all people who try to recline their seats. Maybe hate isn't the right word. Is there a stronger one? God forbid I get stuck in the middle seat during the long flight. By the time we reached camp, my legs had swelled to nearly twice their normal size. We arrived early enough for a walk to stretch our legs. That night, I elevated my legs using the pillow wedge from my bed. Our work days can last 14 hours or more, with most of that time spent on our feet. As the week progressed, I took extra wedges from the attic to get my legs higher. By the end of our stay, there were four of them on my bed. $30,000. Fate, it seemed, had led me here. A year before my first trip to camp, my position working in the office at my church was eliminated in budget cuts designed to create enough funds to bring in a new pastor. With our new pastor came the opportunity to go to Poland for a mission trip he had been involved with for several years. I was immediately interested when I heard about it. The camp, created by the local Lutheran church, combines two things I love, language and sports. The camp is run by the pastor's two sons, Piotrick and Szymek. Using English lessons with Americans as the draw, the church then has the opportunity to share the gospel with youth who may not hear it elsewhere. 10. 10 American teachers went on the trip. With 13 Polish counselors, our total staff was 23, the smallest number ever at the camp. We were all forced to pull double duty, and yet by the end of the camp, Piotrek and Szymek both said it was the best year ever. This year's camp almost didn't happen. The organization that partnered with the camp since its inception pulled out five months before the opening day because they did not have a team leader. To keep the camp going, our church partnered with the church in Yavornik directly. We began the process of overhauling the curriculum too, putting more American culture lesson, cultural lessons in to replace the basic English lessons that rehashed too much of what the kids learned in their schools. But we share more than just our language and faith with these kids. We bring in optimism, enthusiasm, and confidence that is too often lacking in Poland after one occupation followed by another and another. This is a country that once ceased to exist for over a century. Eight. My class consisted of eight students ages 10 to 11. Katie, my co-teacher, was also on her second trip to the camp. In her first year, she was a helper in one of the classrooms. Despite not teaching previously, she often took the lead. My attempts to lead were usually colossal failures. Eight sets of eyes stared blankly at me as I fumbled through explanations of activities that went over their heads. Somehow I was stuck in charge of the games that just didn't work as planned, like follow the leader. Too much confusion, too little connection to the lesson. We tried, we failed. We took them out to the park. To add more English practice to the activity, we put a condition on the game. Who wants to be the leader? Four hands shot up. Whoever can say this morning's Bible verse can lead. Suddenly the interest faded. It didn't help that this day had probably had probably the longest verse of the week. Finally, Sylvia raised her hand. Dear children, let us not love with words. With a lot of help and repetition, she finally got the verse right, but by then, nobody cared to play anymore. Katie always had the better activities to lead, it seemed. Our students responded better to her, although that wasn't always saying a lot. We quickly found out that the best way to get this group of kids to participate was to bribe them with candy or cookies. If they answered questions in class, they got candy. If they correctly recited their Bible verse from chapel, they got a cookie as a reward for being attentive. Eventually, we ran out of junk food. Last year's class was confident in their English skills and participated willingly. This year, the kids were quieter, a little more uncertain of their English. Two, 
the number of hours spent in class each day. Some days when class is going really well and the students are into the activities, those hours fly by. Other days, when every activity you try bombs, like when it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit and there's no air conditioning in the building and you're in the attic and there's no breeze coming through the open windows and the kids are hot and miserable and you run out of games to play because no one, not even you, care, is interested, those two hours can seem like 12. Seven, the time in Yavornik is seven hours ahead of Nebraska. When I get up in the morning in Yavornik, my friends and family at home are preparing for bedtime. 4.30, my eyes open to see light peeking through the lace curtains covering the window above my head. I rubbed my eyes and squinted at my alarm clock on the nightstand. It was 4.30 in the morning, a full 30 minutes before the alarm was set to go off. Back home, it would still be dark for a couple more hours. But here, the sun comes up earlier. I kept the shade closest to my bed, raised just a couple inches, enough to let a little light in without bothering any of my roommates. I set my alarm each morning, but more often than not woke up with the dawn. Most days started damp and foggy and cold as our hiking group assembled. Not until we reached our highest elevation looking down over the town did the sun finally break through. When we arrived at the camp, the area was in a drought meaning they had not had rain in a couple weeks. During one of our earliest hikes, I rubbed my nose and looked down. Does anyone have a tissue? Jackie, our ner team nurse, handed me one. Are you okay, she asked. I'm fine, it's just the dry air. Are you sure it's not your blood pressure? Because that could, it's the air. I get nosebleeds all the time in dry air, I said as I tilted my head back and squeezed my nose in the tissue. I continued walking through the town to the mountains in this manner until finally the bleeding stopped. Near the highest point on our hike, there is a meadow that is a ski run in the winter. In summer, it is the clearing amongst the trees with the most stunning views of the town. From here, the sun shines on the mountaintops, casting a golden hue over all it touches. Down in the valley, red roofs of the town poke out through the, of the misty morning mountain fog that enshrouds everything in a mystical haziness until the sun finally cuts through. This is the view I love the most. The duality of the country itself, the solemn gray leftovers of communist occupation meeting the vibrant light of modernity and Polish cultural resurgence. Each year there's a cultural festival in nearby Wisła. American teachers have an opportunity to go at least once. The streets are lined with vendors selling food, handmade lace, wood carvings, paintings, and other treasures. In the amphitheater, there is a full lineup of musicians, singers, and dancers in traditional dress, keeping the musical history alive for younger generations. The old and the new bl blend here in a way that somehow doesn't seem odd. The kids have smartphones and iPods. They know the latest mu music and movies from the U.S. They love clothing emblazoned with English phrases and American brand names, yet internet connections can be spotty and slow, and their electronic devices are not the same quality as ours. Many people in the area farm. Throughout the day, they will walk their cows and goats to the fields to graze. Some have tractors, though older than what Americans use, but others can still be seen using horse-drawn plows. Most everyone drives cars, but occasionally there are rickety wooden wagons led by horses, sometimes with mismatched wheels. Beautifully built, unique, colorful houses adorned with bold, eye-popping flower baskets sit next to drab, gray, box-like apartment buildings, which are the embodiment of the American vision of living in the Soviet Union. Five, just five more minutes Marisha, who was in her last year at camp, fell in love with baseball. After the first time we played it, she wanted to do nothing but practice hitting. Before chapel, after chapel, after lunch, before supper, after supper, please will you throw to me? She was good. I taught her the proper stance, how to turn her hips and keep the bat level. I was overjoyed to share my love for the game with a camper but lamented that she would never have an opportunity to play on a team. 
Before leaving, we all signed a ball and gave it to her. 30. Each meal break is 30 minutes long. Not much of a problem for breakfast or supper since both are small meals here, often consisting of bread, sliced meat, and cheese. Lunch, however, can be a challenge. It is the main meal of the day and usually includes a soup, potatoes, salad, and meat, or occasionally pasta. On the days when the more popular meals are served, getting food can be a lesson in culinary Darwinism. The kids will reach across the table or the plate of the person next to them to grab what they want or even stand up, walk to the middle of the long table, pick up the bowl of potatoes, and return to their seat with them. Those who politely wait for food to be passed may never get what they asked for. The meek shall go hungry. The day we left camp, the American teachers ate lunch alone because our bus came before the regular lunchtime. Three and a half empty tables in what should have been a packed room. There should have been noise. There should have been laughter. It should have been so loud you could barely hear the person next to you. We ate in near silence. 192. The camp in Yavornik is unique in that we stay at the camp with the students the whole time, 24 hours a day for eight days. That comes to a total of 192 hours or 11,520 minutes spent with our campers and Polish counselors. Tight bonds are formed, making goodbyes difficult. Between the building and the bus, a sea of juvenile faces producing a deluge of tears await. Each hug is more heartbreaking than the last. You don't always know the impact you've had until the very end. Sometimes you don't know how much they or you care until it's time to leave, not knowing if you will ever see them again. As I reached the bus door, one of my students, Claudia, ran up to me and hugged my waist. Looking at me with tears streaming down her cheeks, she said, I love you. I've never been good at saying it, but looking down at this wide-eyed, twiggy little girl with tears in my own eyes, I managed to squeak out an I love you too, before turning to climb the stairs of the bus. From my seat, I watched out the window as students flailed their arms and cried, and 12-year-old boys chased after the bus. Donated by Young. 